Okay. All right, so today we're gonna to be doing the lecture for the second lab, so that's on the strain gauge. And as for the data reduction video for the first lab, uh, what I did is instead of going over in class, I made a video last night and I uploaded that, so it's already up right now. So if you wanna check that out, just click on weeks four and five, go to week four, and then the link for that is right here. So you can click on that. Um, so I, I did this instead because uh, it's one, it's pretty long. It's about an hour and 10 minutes long. And uh, you know, some of you, you're more experienced in MATLAB than others. So you don't need to like stick around, you know, for the entire video, you can just instead kind of scrub through it to the points of interest. And then you can look at it that way. And you can go at your own pace. So, you know, yesterday I actually, uh, for my class yesterday, I did the data reduction with them in class. And um, I don't think it's as good because for a lot of you guys, I'm just kind of throwing a, a ton of stuff at you and it's hard to follow. Um, so it's easier if you can just kind of go at your own pace, you know, go slowly, rewatch certain parts or whatever. Um, so yeah, so that's what I'm doing instead. Um, but if you have any questions, which I'm sure there's going to be, you know, some questions, you can message me in Discord. You can email me too, but I prefer going in Discord because, uh, you know, everyone can see the question and you can PM me if you want, but hopefully you can uh, just ask the message in, in like the main chat in Discord and uh, and everyone can see the question and I can answer it there or another classmate can. And yeah, so again, it's about an hour long because I'm, I'm really going in depth here. Um, I'm kind of, I'm, I made this video with the assumption that you guys basically forgot a shitload of stuff for, for MATLAB and you, you need it like a, you need a really good refresher. So it's very detailed. And what I'll be doing later is adding like on the scrubber here. I don't know what the official term is, but. I'm gonna add little markers on the scrubber and YouTube so you can see uh, what I'm doing in each part of the video. So, you know, in the beginning here, I'm gonna be importing data. Let's see, I could, right here. And so I explain, you know, all of the syntax here and for, uh, for a few minutes, right? And you can just scrub through and see, you know, later on I'm, doing some calculations. So anyways, I'm going to uh, edit the scrubber. So all of these different sections are marked and you can kind of scroll through it that way and it's better. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's up right now. And again, you can just click on week four for our class and you can get the link right there. And uh, so today in class, we're just going to be doing the lecture on the strain gauge and that's it. <clears throat> I have a question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's the code for lab one on MATLAB. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's the code. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't see the question in the chat. Um, so yeah, so that's, it's pretty much all of the code. Uh, let's go over it real quick though. No, not the code, but I'm going to click on assignments. So I've made this assignment for you guys for memo one. And so that's still due on October 1st. So that's two weeks from today. And I've uploaded the deliverables that uh, are associated with this lab. So everything that you need to basically have in your lab memo. So stress and strain, I covered that in the, in the video. That's you know one of the main things we need to do. And then plotting the stress strain curve over the elastic range and the entire range. Gotta do that. So. That's two graphs per material. We have three materials. So in total, we're gonna have six graphs. And there was a question that I got last night uh, from a student um, for the elastic range. Uh, what's the kind of cutoff, you know? So for that, you can just do that for the yield strength that we calculate in the lab and the data reduction. I show you how to do that. And so uh, for making this plot, you can just say, and you can you constrain the amount of data that you're plotting. So instead of plotting the entire range, you can plot just up to that yield strength instead. And 
And that's fine, because really I just want to see a zoomed in picture of the elastic range. And then got to label some stuff. So again, I show you how to do that in the video. So there's two methods. One of them, you can kind of type out whatever you want the label to be. And then when you run your code, MATLAB will show some crosshairs and you can kind of just click wherever you want the label. And another method is actually uh, typing out in your code the X and Y uh, locations, and you can do that too. So I show both methods. Next thing is the error analysis. So in the video, I only talked about uh, solving the elastic modulus. The yield strength, uh, well, actually I did show you how to find the yield strength and the UTS as well in the video. Um, so yeah, so we we find this stuff uh, with uh, you know our code, and then we need to find the percent error. So in the video, I only showed finding the percent error for the elastic modulus, but it's the same thing for the yield strength and the UTS. It's a very simple formula, right? So we're doing that, and then um, finding the percent reduction in cross sectional area. This one wasn't covered in the video just because it's a, such a simple equation again here. Just our initial cross-sectional area minus the final divided by the initial multiplied by 100 to get a percentage. You don't even need to do this in your code. I mean, I would recommend it, but you don't have to do that. You can just use, you know, your calculator and find that really quick. And then at the very end here, we have the expected sample calculation. So if you remember sample calcs they are required um, in the appendix section so let's see that's right here okay sample calcs they're in your appendix section and there are 15 points uh, for this section so you want you want to make sure you do that um, and I only require sample calcs for these four things, nothing else. So you need it for stress, strain, elastic modulus, and percent reduction in cross-sectional area. And basically how you're going to do this is you're going to first show the uh, equation in symbolic form. So like for stress, sigma equals F divided by A. And then you're going to carry out that calculation. So, you know, you're going to plug in for uh, the force, for the area and then solve for it. And you only need one sample calculation per um, know, topic here. So, you know, we solved stress for three different materials, but I only need to see one sample calculation for stress and same thing for strain and everything else. Okay, so that's the deliverables and you're gonna submit your submission you're going to upload your submission as a PDF. Okay, that's the only format that's allowed. I don't want to see a Word doc. It gets uh, tedious to convert everyone's Word doc to PDF. So make sure you do that conversion yourself before you upload it. Uh, I restrict the file document so you can only upload a PDF anyways. The memo, you know, you got to work on that by yourself. You can talk to your classmates and me and whatnot in Discord for how to do something in the data reduction, but your actual memo that you type out, that's got to be your own work. And also, let me go back to student view, your data from lab one, I uploaded that. So you can go to files and then click on experiment one and then lab data. And Okay, yeah, so I guess I didn't get the data for group one, which seems kind of incredible to me because uh, I remember going to each computer and getting the data, but I guess I, I messed up. Uh, so group one, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have your data, apparently. Uh, you can use data from a different group. So group two, they have everything here. So group two, if you wanna use their data, you can use their data. Uh, next week when we have our second lab, I'll make sure to double check that I actually have everyone's data on my flash drive. So sorry about that.
where you put the rest of the calculation results not covered in the sample calcs, that's going to be in the results section. So um, like the, uh, the yield strength, stuff like that, you're going to have all of that in the results section. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to do the lecture on the strain gauge. So remember that the strain gauge, it looks like this. Uh, ours is going to look a little bit different, but it's um, this uh, device that's bonded directly to the material that we're testing. So in the background here, you can see that we have it's, uh, probably a metal rod. So and, that, and that's what we're doing. So we have a strain gauge. It's attached in our case to, I think it's aluminum. 6061 T6. And for the second lab, we only have one material and we're going to test it three times though. And because we attach it to the rod and that's its own process, we're not going to break the material. And the computer, it's set up so it doesn't uh, go past, I think it's like um, 1600 pounds, something like that. So we're still well within the elastic range of our material. Um, okay. And in this lab, we're going to still be using the extensometer. Uh, but in, in addition to that, we're going to have the strain gauge that's applied to the rod. And both of these, you know, the end goal for both of these devices is to obtain strain data. So with the extensometer, you know, now from lab one that that measures the deformation directly. And then we have to convert that to strain ourselves. The strain gauge, um, it's going to give us the strain directly. So we're going to be using the lab view with the strain gauge. And as we run the test uh, directly in the software, it's going to tell us the strain. So we don't have to do anything ourselves. And uh, basically, we're going to compare the results that we get with uh, both of these methods. We're going to see which one is more accurate. And that's only one you know, kind of piece of the pie here. So we're going to see which is more accurate and they're both, they should be very similar. Um, but we're also going to talk about, you know, which one is more practical to use. So which one is easier to set up? Which one is, um, let's say more consistent to you with the readings, um, things like that. So you're going to talk about that in your memo. Okay. So let me go to my other screen here. And this is going to be a, a pretty fast lecture too. So like we just said, the strain gauge, it's, um, uh, you know, the goal for that is to, to measure strain, to give us the strain value. So it's similar to the extensometer for our use and that both the extensometer and the strain gauge, they have the same goal, which is to give us a reading for strain. Okay, and to repeat myself a little bit, remember the extensometer, it by itself, it only measures deformation. So we have to convert that deformation to strain. The strain gauge, um, what it does is it actually, it measures a change in electrical resistance, which we're about to talk about, but kind of behind the scenes in the software, it converts that change uh, to strain and it'll give us that reading directly in the software. So both things for our use case, uh, they're, they're going to obtain strain. They do, uh, but they, they do that in a different manner. Okay. So the strain gauge, like I said, uh, what it does is it measures a change in electrical resistance and it's going to convert that to your strain.
All right, and it's going to do this, you know, just with a, a formula that we're going to derive uh, really soon here. It's pretty simple, though. So let's actually, let's draw a little picture to give a better idea of how this all works. Okay, so let's say that we have a rod and the rod is in tension, which is still going to be the case for lap two. So we're still applying tension. And then on this rod, we have our strain gauge. Obviously, that's not the scale. But our strain gauge, that's going to be directly bonded to the rod. And the strain gauge, it's going to look something like this. Um, I mean, not really. It's going to look prettier than that. But imagine that this is uh, our strain gauge. So the strain gauge, it has these thin metal wires, which is what I just drew in blue. And as we apply tension on the rod, the strain gauge, just like the extensometer, it's going to experience the, or it's going to deform at the same rate as the rod. And um, another way you can think about it is it's going to undergo strain at the same rate as the rod does. And these metal wires, as they undergo strain, their electrical resistance is going to change. So the change in the electrical resistance of these wires is going to be proportional to the change in strain that it experiences. And from that change in resistance, we can use a, a formula to convert that change to strain. All right, so let's, let's write that out. Okay, there we go. All right, so just to repeat that, um, as the rod deforms, the metal wires that we have here in blue, they are going to deform at the same rate as the rod. Another way to think about it is it's, they're going to undergo strain at the same rate as the rod, and that strain is going to cause the electrical resistance in these wires to, uh, to change. And that electrical resistance can be converted um, because there's a, a proportional relationship to strain, uh, that resistance can be converted to strain. And so we're going to derive what this relationship looks like uh, for resistance and strain. So uh, the way that this strain gauge is set up, or these wires uh, set up, that, that matters. They're set up in a manner where it's going to be most sensitive to the change in strain. So if we have on the same strain gauge, let me move this over here. On the same strain gauge, if we had another uh, set of metal wires, but instead of being orientated like these ones are in blue, if they were like this, then it wouldn't be as sensitive to strain. Um, okay, so let's write that. Not as sensitive to strain. Okay, and this can actually be beneficial for us. And uh, what this would be called in purple and be called a dummy gauge because it's not sensitive to strain, 
but both of these different strain gauges that we have or these different metal wires they're both going to be subjected you know to the same temperature environment and temperature does have an effect on the strain gauge you know if it's uh, heating up it's going to expand a little bit if it's cooling down it's going to contract and that's going to affect the electrical resistance to an extent but if both of these wires are affected by temperature the same way but they're affected by strain differently and we can account for that change in temperature or the temperature effects on the strain gauge and i'll keep saying this a lot but this is something that happens behind the scenes in the software so um so the strain gauge does have a, a method to deal with temperature effects Okay, so now we're going to get into the math. It's not a super long derivation, so don't worry. And you don't need to even worry about the derivation too much. It's mostly to give all of you uh, some background on, on how this relationship with the resistance and strain actually came about. So you don't need to even, you know, you don't need to have the derivation in your memo. Don't even really need to talk about it. The main takeaway I want you to have in this lecture is how the strain gauge works, which you should already know by now for how many times I've said it, but it's converting the change in resistance to, uh, to strain. All right, so the math. So we're gonna start from a point of the formula for resistance uh, for our metal wire. Okay, so resistance is going to be given by R, and that'll be equal to, that's a rho, so rho times L divided by A. So R, again, is the resistance. Rho is going to be the resistivity, I'll talk about that in a second. L is obviously the length of the wire. And A, obviously the cross-sectional area of the wire. Okay, so rho, you can think back. I, I don't know when you, you talked about it last. It's probably been a while, so maybe... 226 for physics, you might have talked about it then, uh, maybe in your circuits class if you've taken that yet. I know some people, they take circuits like uh, when they're seniors, um, keep putting it off. I would take it right after 226, but anyways, that that's uh, irrelevant here. Or maybe it's even back in high school for physics back then. But resistivity, that's, um, that's a material property, and that's how much a material can resist uh, electric current. So if a material has low resistivity, then electric current is easily passed through it. So um, just remember that. And again, that's a material property. So that's going to be um, a constant value here. Okay, so there we go. And if you if you look at this, we have two variables that are going to change, right? So rho, the resistivity, that's going to be held constant. But as we apply load to the rod, the the length of the metal wires, they're going to change, they're going to increase. 
and the cross-sectional area of the metal wires, they're going to change. They're going to decrease, you know, just like the rod uh, during our test. So both of those are changing. So that's two variables changing, but we would like to have only one variable in here changing because as we continue on here, we're eventually going to differentiate both sides because we want to remember, we want to have a change in resistance uh, for our relationship to strain. And if we have two variables that are changing, it just makes it a little more complex. So we only want one to change. So what we're going to do is assume that the volume of the metal wire is constant. So we have the length of the wire with the area. So we have a relationship to volume there. And then again, we're going to assume that that volume is held constant, which in reality, it's not absolutely true, but it's really close. So we can make that assumption. And then we're going to rewrite our formula now to be R is equal to rho times L squared over volume. So now we only have one variable that's changing. So now only the length is changing. The resistivity, that's a material property that's constant. And the volume, we're going to assume that that's constant. Okay, and at this point, we're going to do something that, you know, if I was watching this lecture, I would say, you know, that's really random. And it does look a little random at first. We're going to take the log of both sides. But uh, just like every step, basically, we're doing that for convenience. So we're going to take the log of both sides, and then we're going to differentiate both sides. And then we can get it to our nice form of having a change in resistance. So when's the last time you've done logs? I don't even know. I mean, I guess you do it in calc sometimes, but not often. So take log, maybe in stats. Take log of both sides. Yeah, Amr, we're going to get it into a, a linear relationship in the end here. So take log of both sides. So we're going to have the log of R for our resistance. And that's now going to be equal to 2 times log of L, our length, plus the log of the resistivity over the volume. Kind of a tree down or something. Okay, so this is what we have now, and now we're going to differentiate everything. All right, and then again, so we're doing, uh, you know, we take the log of both sides so we can then differentiate them. And then we're going to be able to get a form of having a change in resistance, which is what we wanted uh, earlier on. So we're going to have dr over r, which really is just the change in resistance over the resistance. That'll be equal to 2 times dl over l plus 0. So it's plus 0 because we have, uh, we're differentiating a constant. Remember, so uh, so that's a constant because our resistivity that's constant volume is constant um again that's why we assume that the volume is constant so we don't need to deal with that now so if we look at our equation here it seems pretty familiar hopefully you see dl over l so at the change in length over the length that's strain right there so now we're going to be able to have that uh, linear relationship 
between the change in resistance to strain. So let's rewrite this as delta R over R equals two times delta L over L. Again, that strain, and then we can rewrite this again to solve for strain. So I'm gonna call it epsilon now instead. So epsilon is gonna be equal to one over two times delta R over R. All right. And so if you look at this, you know, we have a, um, a constant out in front of our change in resistance. And that constant is important. Um, um, okay, yeah, so that constant is important, okay? Um, depending on the strain gauge that you have, well, every single strain gauge has a different sensitivity to strain. So instead of always being one over two, um, each strain gauge, again, has different sensitivity to strain. So instead of this constant being one over two, it might be one over 2.1, one over 2.14, whatever. Um, and that constant is determined from the manufacturer. So what they do is they, they calibrate the strain gauges that they have uh, to, to see what the sensitivity to strain is. And then they'll give you a number called the gauge factor. And again, that'll be something like 2.1, 2.12, 2.14. It's always going to be around there. So if a, if one strain gauge um, is maybe, you know, it's like this, okay, it's set up where it has a gauge factor of two, uh, but a different uh, strain gauge has a gauge factor of 2.14, you know, it's a change in electrical resistance is also going to be different. So this doesn't mean, you know, if you have a gauge factor of two versus 2.14, it doesn't mean that one strain gauge is better than the other. It just means that it's, it has a different sensitivity to that strain. And they account for that via this cali calibration factor or gauge factor. Okay, so with that, let's rewrite our equation again. So we'll say that our strain is equal to one over GF, so GF being gauge factor, multiplied by delta R over R. So the gauge factor, again, that's uh, given to you from the manufacturer. And for us, all of our strain gauges have a gauge factor of 2.14. And um, just like everything else for the strain gauge, this is actually already taken into account in the software. So, you know, some time ago, it's probably probably been years and years and years ago now, uh, our lab technician, Don, he put the gauge factor into the software. So into LabVIEW, uh, that's again, 2.14. And all, um, all of this is done behind the scenes for us. So we don't need to actually uh, do anything with this gauge factor, it's taken care for us. Um, so LabVIEW, it, it knows the gauge factor and it's applying that uh, when uh, it's converting the change in resistance to, to strain.
Okay, so for us, uh, just to recap, you know, yes, it, it's good to know where this, um, you know, how the string gauge is working, right? It's good to know um, how it's getting that change in resistance and converting it to, to strain. But we don't need to actually deal with any of this uh, derivation, you know, once we're actually doing the, the lab. We're just going to look at lab view and it's going to tell us the value for string directly. And we're just going to write that down. Uh, you know, you can either write it down on a piece of paper, or I think uh, there's probably an Excel spreadsheet that we have. And we'll, of course, we'll talk about this next week, right? But um, for the lab, we're going to be running the experiment and we're going to be stopping it in intervals of like uh, 100 pounds. And once we stop it, we're going to write down the value for deformation that we have that's from the X tensometer. And we're also going to write down the value of the strain that we have from the strain gauge. And then we'll resume it and keep going like that. Okay, so that's the strain gauge. Okay. Um, so any questions on the strain gauge before I wrap up? Okay. All right, so let's see. A little, a few reminders. Your first memo is. Sorry, can I see that screen one more time? I... Sorry about yeah. that. Okay, so you, your first memo, that's going to be due on October 1st. So that's still two weeks from now. You got it. Thank you. Okay. So we'll go back here. So to, to turn it in, remember, you can click on assignments, click on memo one, stress and strain. You're going to turn it in there as a PDF. And also the data reduction for lab one, that's already up right now and it's fully processed. So it looks good. And you can get that either. Um, from here, click on week four, click on the link here, or just go on the home page, right? And click on the YouTube link. Videos, and here we go, right here. Uh, experiment one, stress and strain, data reduction. Click on that, and there you go. You can follow that at your own pace. And again, later today, I'm going to Put in a little markers on the scrubber for YouTube so you can see what I'm doing at, at which point in the video and not have to scroll through yourself and, and see what I'm doing. All right, so that'll be up sometime today. And next week we're doing lab two, so make sure you show up. You gotta be in person. We're gonna meet in class first at uh, E42, and then we'll talk about the lab for a few minutes. And we're gonna head over you guys are going to do the experiment. I'm not going to have a in-depth demo like I did for lab one, because now you guys are familiar with the, with the machine and how to use it. So basically, uh, for the most part, you're just going to do the experiment on your own. Of course, I'll be walking around making sure everything is going good. Yeah, yeah. lab two is next week. Okay, so that's all I got for today. So if there's any more questions, you can stick around. But if not, I'll see you guys next week in person for the lab and have a good weekend. Thanks, Amro, you too. Uh, Professor, I just have one, one small question real quick. Um, as far as the MATLAB video that you posted, does that just go over the MATLAB or is that kind of going over like the format of the, um, of the memo? Uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I can't remember. I can, it was drawing a blank on that word. Thank you of the memo. Yeah. Uh, it's only on MATLAB. So for the actual like format for the report, um, just check the syllabus for that for like every section. So that's here. Just make sure that you, you're covering everything that's here. I forgot to talk about the abstract, so I'll do that next week. But um, yeah. I'm going to upload. I'm going to try to find an example abstract, and I'll put that on Canvas because I know a lot of you haven't written one yet. Yeah, that's what that's where I was kind of going at, too, is I haven't mm -hmm. written one. So yeah, um, yeah kind of confused on how to. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I'll try to find one, you know, uh, th this weekend, and then I'll upload it for you guys. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. And also, about the format of the memo, do we need to like have stuff in between, like computation, or is it just going to be like abstract, then just numbers after that? Uh, no, it's not just going to be numbers. So, yeah, don't do that. So, you're going to have your abstract, then you have the results section, but um, so you are going to have numbers there, and that's what's in the deliverables handout. But and you're also going to have your plots, and you need to interpret what those plots are. like. What what do they tell us? Um, so you're going to have a little bit of a discussion there, and then you expand upon it in the next section. You know, you're you're going to get a better idea once I I grade the first one. I grade it easier than the others because I know it's new. But you just need to make sure that once you, if you're giving a result, you need to discuss it to to some extent. All right, for sure. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? All right, if not, then I'm going to stop the meeting and I'll see all of you next week. All right, bye-bye.